The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForm.com, IgnitionAPG.com, PlayUSA at PLAEUSA.com, and Soranex Exercise Equipment at Soranex.com. And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeever. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the Let's max. Go. Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeefery straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeefery. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Rob McKeefrey, and this is episode number 126. Really excited to have Rich Gray with us today. Rich is a good buddy for a lot of years. We go way back. Um, He's been a guy that has been uh, somebody that I've leaned on um, from a coaching perspective, from a business perspective, from um, just interacting and friendship and, you know, ups and downs and the whole deal. He's a true friend. And, uh, you know, we had him stop by uh, the facility when he was in town uh, and just had an opportunity to sit down with him, uh, some of the other members of of the play team. Uh, You know, we're we're thinking about doing some things up there, but also uh, wanted to get him to get in front of our intern staff and ask questions and uh, most gracious to sit there. I mean, we we went for multiple hours and and, uh, just talked about life, talked about uh, the business talked about, um, you know, having the, the ups and downs of this profession. And uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's been a strength coach. Um, he's been uh, in the performance world. He's been in the business world. Uh, he, he brings a unique perspective. And I, I know you are going to get a ton out of this episode. Before we do, I want to make sure we recognize all of our sponsors. We have EliteForm.com, Ignition APG. Uh, Sornex, and of course play, and and I know what you're thinking. I think you, you think that this is going to be a sales pitch for play, and we we were really cautious for that not to be the case. Uh, it's a great product, and I'm not going to lie. And and um, you know we do talk about it. We talk a little bit about what you should look like, look for in flooring, but we mostly talk about you know facility design, what you should be doing from a facility design perspective, and as a vendor. Um, Rich gets the unique perspective of being able to go in and out of the best weight rooms in the in the country and around the world. And so uh, we talk a lot about that. But, you know, if you are in the market for a floor, reach out to those guys. Uh, product second to none. They got a new blog, playhard.com, P-L-A-E, hard, H-A-R-D.com. Um, a blog, you know, they, got a, they, they have some uh, training articles and things along those lines, and they're, they're doing a you know, great job with that. And, uh, you know, make sure you reach out to them on, on Facebook, Twitter, follow them. They, they put out some great content um, from month to month as well. And so uh, for nothing else, let them know that you appreciate them for supporting Iron Game Chalk Talk and, and uh, what we're trying to do here. They're coming back on board for 2016 and uh, couldn't be more pleased to be associated with a, a great organization, a great group. Also, want to um, bring your attention to uh, uh, Donnell Boucher. Uh, we all know Donnell. Donnell was the one that interviewed me in the 100th episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Uh, a great friend as well and um, some tragedy, you know, and this is, you know, and, and with our show, you know, the number one goal of Iron Game Chalk Talk was to make sure that we give back to coaches in any way possible, you know, and mostly that's been educational, but, um, you know, I, I think his... his uh, uncle, cousin, I'm not exactly sure uh, the particulars of the family, but there was a tra- you know a tragic fire up in Massachusetts where he's from, uh, claimed the life of two family members, and um, you know just an awful, awful thing. And uh, if you know Donnell, you know what kind of big heart he has, and how he's constantly giving uh, back to the community. Um, and this is a way that we can we can rally around one of our own. And so uh, I'm going to make sure to link up this this youcaring.com uh, uh, link 
but it's just a crowdfunding thing uh, to support his family and to be able to, uh, you know, for the house fire and the recovery effort and, and all that. But, um, you know, I want to be able to bring stuff like this to our community. And, uh, you know, this show goes out to 6,000 plus coaches. And if everybody just, you know, logged in and donated a dollar, um, you know, I think his goal, you know, his goal or his family's goal is $7,500. I mean, you know, that's easy. And we should be jumping at the chance uh, to be able to help, you know, people that are, you know, our brothers and sisters in need. You know, we had Megan Young recently uh, that we did something similar for and, and now Donnell. And, and I could only encourage you guys to do as much as you can uh, to support him and his family in this in this in this tragic time. And so uh, I want to get to this episode. I'll make sure to link all this stuff up. Know you're going to really enjoy Rich uh, and what he has to say. Unique perspective. And uh, we'll see you on the other side. Thanks. On. Good. All right, guys. Hey, welcome back. Real excited to have a good friend of, my, of mine here with us, Rich Gray. I've known Rich for a ton of years. One of us, uh, strength coach, um, entrepreneur, guy that's just been at it at every level. And uh, has an awesome story. First and foremost, uh, a veteran, and, and you guys that watch the show, and you guys know that um, you know it's uh, I, the utmost respect. But you know, I want him to go into this story. But we're doing this kind of live version. He's in town. Um, excited about no that. Mistakes. Got some of the staff from play here, and uh, we got Dina and Dave, and and uh, you guys know how I feel about about play, and uh, they're a big part of the show. And so. Rich, thanks for coming, man. And, thanks for and, having you me. Know, man. Have you know? Let's 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 go all the way back to the Marine days. <laughs> you know, kind of why you it's got into the road. field, and, long then, road. and then uh, you know what's taking you to play. Well, it, it uh, I tell you, I was I was uh, got 18 years old when I went to Marine Corps, and uh, knew college wasn't for me, and and uh, got recruited to wrestle, and of all things, and, and uh, Greg Gibson recruited me out of out of high school to go to the Marine Corps to wrestle, and. Ended up in the Marine Corps and uh, uh, honestly forgot about wrestling in the beginning and, and wanted to go full hard, just be a Marine and, and learned a massive amount. And in that process, uh, ended up on the All Marine team wrestling for, for three, four years with some phenomenal guys and made a couple of world teams in Sambo style wrestling and, and kind of went on from there. And when I got out, again, I was faced with the dilemma do I go to school? What do I do with my life? And uh, it's, a, it's a decision that a lot of people end up in those crossroads. And, and uh, the one thing I can tell you is that I, I, I went to a small school in North, North Carolina named Chuan College, and it was a junior college at the time, and, and uh, probably the best mood I've made in my life. They had about eight, 900 students, so everybody uh, uh, knew each other. And uh, got my foot in the door as a wrestler, ended up as a head wrestling coach, and ended up uh, working in conditioning programs and that's how I kind of got into strength conditioning and found it as a passion gave up wrestling and, and coaching and became a, uh, a strength coach for the next four years for baseball for football for basketball and, and uh, at, a, at a small junior college division three school I, I remember I got uh, uh, 250 dollars a month uh, uh, pay and uh, and, um, and I, I didn't even have a meal plan uh, was going to school full time while I was doing it and uh, uh, was in Atlanta with the baseball team one year for a tournament and saw an ad on a, on a bulletin board at Emory University that said uh, 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 positions for the United States Olympic Training Center. And I pulled that ad off the bulletin board and I went back and, and I, told, uh, I told my advisor, I said, this is what I want to do. And I uh, went for the job and Dr. Steve Fleck called me that spring and interviewed me. And, I got the position through him and ended up working with Steve Plisk at the Olympic Training Center, uh, which, which led me to the following year uh, taking a position with Joe Kinn at Boise State. Had a phenomenal two years with Joe and uh, uh, learned a massive lot and, and, and gained a family member out of that, out of that move. Um, and then my wife and I went to, from there, we went down to Atlanta, uh, started programs at, at St. Pius in Westminster and, and had some phenomenal four years there, but life changed. Um, for me, it was a decision of what's next, what am I going to do? And my wife wanted to stay home when we had kids. So, you know, for me, it was a, a, a business decision where uh, I ended up uh, literally on a sabbatical from Westminster visiting schools up the East Coast. And I was sitting on a park bench outside of uh, Harvard and MIT on the Charles River. 
I, I'll never forget the day. It was about 75 degrees, beautiful uh, September day. And I said to myself, I can do this for a living. I can go around, talk to coaches, design facilities, and, and have something to give. And uh, um, I called uh, Jake Burkhart at York Barbell and literally drove down there the next day and made a plea for a job. And uh, um, two months later, I was working with York Barbell managing the uh, commercial side, um, which everything happens for reasons. A year later, as you know in the coaching world how it happens every year, well, next thing you know, I'm out of a job, middle of the year. Uh, York closed down and, and here I was. I remember sitting at the house that day and my wife coming home and she says, uh, um, she was, what's wrong? And I, I looked at her and I said, I'm, I'm out of a job. And I hadn't been in that situation because I had teacher contracts and I had ways that things were going to be taken care of. And uh, I'll never forget, she looked at me and, and I was pretty down, you know, uh, and, uh, and she said, well, what do you want to do next? And I remember sitting there and I was like, well, I said, we got some customers to take care of first. We got customers to take care of with York and uh, Lauren Seagrave called me with Velocity and, uh, and uh, took off and, and, and went to Velocity went 85 facilities later opening on the road hiring over a hundred and something coaches over a five-year period um, i like to say i got my mba at velocity um, it was a massive learning experience i went through a buyout i went through dealing with uh, 60 000 foot purchases of facilities to uh, uh, all the way down to managing them to uh, uh, training of coaches in, in the facilities to dealing with uh, uh, parents of kids that came into facilities to uh, uh, run in a facility myself. And, and, and I tell you, it's a very rude awakening when somebody hands you a key to a business and gives you a P&L and says, all right, here's our break even, go make it, or otherwise we lose money. And it's a, it's a very touch of reality. Um, did that for five years and then uh, Ended up the next next chapter in life was was life fitness and hammer strength, you know, and and what a phenomenal chapter it was. Uh, and, uh, spent eight years there. Uh, got to assist in the development of two different rack lines. Got to develop the, the hammer strength clinic series and and uh, started with one, took them to 54, and then uh, when I left, passed that off to Lawn Record and uh, joined Play two years ago and went and grabbed Dave Turner from uh, the Hammer Strength and Life and brought him with me. And uh, a couple others, Randy Fessler, and we went and grabbed uh, Shauna Healy from Iron Grip, uh, Bob Kelly from Life Fitness and Hammer, and, and uh, uh, created a sales team that I think rivals most companies out there. And uh, you know what? Now we're we're attacking facilities and uh, from the ground up. So that's kind of the You're in the nuts of it. All over the world. Yeah, we're we're. I launched us internationally uh, um, about a year and a half ago. Um, that's a very different education right there in itself. Uh, uh, launching a business internationally, understanding the, the ins and outs of the shipping processes to the order processes to, uh, uh, you know, it's funny because we, in America, we don't think about size of facilities or size of hallways or size of streets make a difference. But when you're trying to take a 15 foot long roll of turf that's 100 feet long into a, uh, uh, four foot corridor down three flights of stairs in, these are the things that you have to worry about in the UK and uh, uh, all the way through to what we're doing in Australia. So it's been uh, it's been a great road, very yeah. great road. Well, tons of perspective there, right? Unique perspective. You know, uh, seen it at, at college, seen it at pro, seen it at uh, performance facilities, seen it from a business side. And, you know, I would, I would venture to say that you're a, you know, if you went back to being a strength coach today, you would be a much better strength coach no question. No question. From having that skill set that you've developed by, you know, uh, going through all the different phases of that journey. You know, in, in what you said, the journey, it, it was a journey, you know, and it continues to be a journey. I, uh, um, any, any time you can walk into somebody's facility and you can talk to them and listen to them and learn uh, uh, how they're doing things, what they're doing, how they're not, it's not just training teams, it's, it's how they're managing their facilities. You know, it's how uh, um, it's how they're storing their accessories. It's it's how they have the racks set up. It's how they where they got the cardio, where they've got the machines. There there's so many variations out there. Nobody does it the same. And uh, when you when you have that opportunity to learn at that level, grassroots and hands on, it, it it's amazing. 
you know, the, the people that I've been able to work with. You know, uh, not just those that I've reported to, but those that I've worked in partnerships with. You know, uh, and, uh, like, great example, Ronnie and I connected it when he was in South Florida, and, and, and we've had more intimate conversations about business life and coaching than, than anything else. You know, same thing with, you know, Joe Ken is, is family to me. You know, I mean, and, and Joe and I are, 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 you know, we don't even talk about strength conditioning when we talk. It's about family. What are we doing? How are we doing this? You know, it's it's what are you, what are you seeing different out there in the world? You know, and uh, when you can walk in uh, earlier today, we were at uh, uh, Central Michigan. We were at. Uh, 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 I, I apologize. Yeah, I'm just and uh, I'm uh, we we were up at Central Michigan, and we were at uh, Michigan State, and and you know we're we're walking around, and, and you're getting to listen to their coaches every day. You know, and and not many people get that opportunity, even in the coaching world. You know, in the coaching world. What amazes me is is that coaches will be in the same city, and yet they never get together. Okay, they never get together to talk. You know, one of the things when when I was in Atlanta, uh, uh, all the high school strength coaches in Atlanta, and I'm talking like Eric Lugas, C.J. Stockel, uh, uh, Scott Mandy at Maris. There was there was about eight of us. We all met every other month at a restaurant, and we would just eat dinner, and we just sit and talk. And, and that's something that, you know, coaches do it at the national conferences, and I know the schedules are tight and busy and everything else, but that networking and that interaction, you learn so much it's ridiculous, okay? And, and if you just sit back and absorb what they're, what they're teaching you, you know, you don't have to use it all, and you're not going to use it all, but every coach is a thief, okay? Every coach reaches out, and they, they, they pull, and they take, and they, they adjust what they need for their programs. You know, you mentioned you know, and when we talk about that skill set, and one of the things that I talk about, I've talked about in my book, was, you know, having a plan, you know, for the times that you're either out of the profession or the times that you choose that family, you know, is going to be more important in this period of my life or, or, or whatever, you know. With developing that skill set, I, I would imagine that that was an eye-opener to you as you went through that process, that you were like, man, if I only knew this when I was a strength coach, if I only knew that when I was a strength coach, Talk to, you know, uh, the audience about kind of, you know, the, the, the necessary evil of going outside of your box of strength and conditioning and learning um, from leadership and motivation and accounting and uh, business and all these different things that are going to turn around and make you a better coach. You know, I, I, I think the, the biggest element I can sit here and say is, is this, that your job is a brand and your job is a business. At every every level, all right, and 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 I say that because from the time you're an intern, the time I was a volunteer strength coach, all the way up until I got my first head job, all the way up until when I was uh, uh, even to the day, okay. Your name is your brand. That's who you are. You know, I I have a saying that there's there's only one thing uh, that you can control in this industry, and that's your integrity. I can't control anything else, nor can you, all right? But I know I can control Rage my losses, integrity. losses, so, firings. No, you, you, you can't. You can't, control that. you can't control anything that's occurring. The reality side of it is, is on the strength conditioning side, the management side, the business side, it, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I'm running a business or I'm running a program. <clears throat> the reality of it is you got to learn to manage. you got to learn to lead. you got to learn to guide. And you got to continue to learn yourself, okay? And, and in that process, you know, making the transition to the business side, you know, I, I miss coaching. I miss it every day, okay? But I look at it like this. I got a phenomenal team on the sales side that I coach every day. I got a phenomenal group of people that, that I've been able to take in and, and together we're growing. We're growing a business, we're growing a company, all right? And then at the same time, I get my coaching fixed because I'm in with coaches every day. I'm sitting here at a table with a lot of young coaches right here. All right, well, you know, I was there. I know what you're about to go through, okay? And I can tell you this, and I, I, I've, I've been with old guys like this forever, but, and I'll tell him like I tell everybody is, is that, and I've said this many times, you better have a parachute plan when you get near the age of 50, okay? I, I, I've seen it way too many times. Great coaches in our industry, you know, uh, uh, two years ago, three years ago, I, I, Kevin Yoxel, 
was out of a job, okay? And, and you know what? There was, not a, there was not a sunrise coming over the horizon for him. It looked bleak, and he had to go to the high school side. Here's a guy that was at, at, at major national championship program, Auburn, you know, and all of a sudden he's out of a job. Are you kidding me? You know, he's one of the greats in our industry. You know, uh, and, um, I think that being so close to Joe Ken during the time when, when he was out of a job at Louisville, that changed his life, okay? Have, having to step out there and, and jump into the personal side, the, the, the everyday strength conditioning side on the performance side is a totally different animal, okay? Because now you, everybody thinks they can do it, right? Everybody thinks they can step away and step in and open their own personal gym. But I'm gonna tell you something, it's a rude awakening. It isn't for everybody, all right? And, and, and when you got a break even that you gotta hit, from an accounting standpoint, every 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 month, okay. If you got to break even of thirty thousand, you got to bring thirty thousand dollars worth of business in just to break even, just to pay your bills, okay. Then you're going to turn around and you got to bring in more to, to cover your living cost of living plus all your all your coaches and everything else that you're doing. So it's a uh, uh, it's a rude awakening for a lot of people. But if you look at it and you say to yourself, how long are you going to coach, okay? What do you want out of life, right? For me and my family at the time was this. I had been at, at, that was our fourth move. I had been at Boise State for two years and we went through three head football coaches, okay? And I can tell you that I wrestled my off. I didn't play the game of football. That was the first rude awakening, okay? Because I realized real quick, no matter how good I am, it's gonna be a lot longer road to get to that head football job because I did not play the game of football, okay? So, so that, was, that was the first strike. The next strike was that you're on the coattail of somebody else, okay? So you're, you're you know, th th for those young coaches out there, the old dogs know, you know what you're getting into, you know how it goes. But we went through three head football coaches. The first coach, Pokey Allen, passed away. I watched that entire staff rip each other apart, okay? And they were battling. And then we turned around, Houston Nutt came in, all right? Houston was there for a year, right? Turned around and left, went to Arkansas, then Dirk Cutter came in, right? And 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 at that point after after we had left, that's when they started they started on the winning streaks. But it uh, uh, it opened my eyes up to say, okay, I want something more stable for my family, right? And at that point, I turned around and went down to the high school level down in uh, in Atlanta, and I got the stability out of the high school side. But what I didn't have was I, I wanted to grow. And when you're, when you're in one place, I'm not, a in, I'm not a in one place type of guy, okay? I got, I got to keep moving, I got to keep having education, I got to keep growing. And uh, um, what it said to me was is that I wanted to try the business side. And when I stepped into that business world, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, it's got its own challenges every day. Just like your challenges with your individual coaches, where you got to learn to be flexible. Well, you got people you're answering to. Okay, I got bosses that I got to answer to on a daily basis, or depending on what kind of job you're in, or you got a board you got to answer to. Okay, which is multiple personalities. All right, uh, and, um, but you got to constantly drive forward and learn from your mistakes because the difference is now too is just like on this side, your mistakes hurt your familyhood. Okay. Your mistakes hurt your brand, all right? And that's one of the biggest things that I try to teach young people is, is that your brand and who you are, okay, is, is gonna be with you from the now until the time you're gone, all right? You know, and you look at some of our great coaches out there that, that and I talk about this age of 50 thing, you know, uh, uh, John Detman at University of Wisconsin. I got to know John very well when, when, when I was doing his, uh, uh, his redesign of his room up there. And uh, um, John, you know, you don't get along with everybody that you meet. And John and I butt heads in the beginning. I mean, he, he'd yell at me on the phone and hang up the phone. I'd call him back, we'd yell, he'd hang up the phone, okay? We, we had a, a, a great love-hate relationship in the beginning. But I always treated him with respect. I earned his respect. And I helped him. And I helped show him a different way of doing things, okay? And at the same time, I learned from him, and I watched him take and elevate himself up, and he's in, he's in a role where he oversees the whole program now, and he was smart, 
he had a, he, he put he got a young guy in that was his assistant they put in charge of football. He elevated himself up. Right? He created opportunities through nutrition. Okay? Got with dairy sciences on campus, had dairy sciences create their whey protein, had dairy sciences create bars for them. They, they he developed systems that encompassed all sports. All sports which he didn't have necessarily he wasn't in touch with at that time. Now all of a sudden he's in touch with all the sports. So he created value, okay? And when he created that value, he gave himself an extension on his job, extension on his life, all right? And that's the thing when I say 50, you know, you, you gotta have a parachute plan. You gotta have it planned because I can tell you, there's a lot of strength coaches out there looking for jobs all the time. And there's people looking to move up into different areas. What is your plan? What sector of business are you gonna try to go into? And, and you gotta look at, your job as a strength coach as a business and you got to treat it as a business and if you go around the nation you know Pat Ivey's an, another great one that, that uh, uh, the stuff he's done with his staff the development that he's done with the staff the creativity of, of, of positioning within his staff and everything else you know the, those guys that, that are that are thinkers you know it's like it's like Ronnie with with his intern program and, and everything that he's doing you know it, it you're creating value Okay? And every day that you can create that value, you become more valuable brand for somebody else to link into. Okay? And it, it all comes back to your name and who you are. All right? You can be the smartest guy in the room, but if you don't know everybody in the room and you don't know how to get to that next step, you're going to get left out. Okay? I'm not the smartest guy in the room, I can tell you that right now. By no means. Okay? My personality you know, uh, uh, two, only two people have ever written letters for me, a recommendation. And I think this is this is says a lot right here. Steve Pliss was one, Joe Kim was the other. And and to paraphrase the last paragraph, I still have those letters. And to paraphrase the last paragraphs, basically in a nutshell, both of them said, I wish I had his personality and his ability to build relationships with his athletes and the way he does with his coaches. Okay. I've taken that personality trait and I've built my brand on it, okay? Because I can tell you this, if I walk in and I'm in a room and I'm talking to you, I'm gonna take care of you. If there's an issue or a problem, I'm gonna help you out, okay? I have more people that'll call me asking for advice or help and I'll, I'll, I'll sit on the phone, there's, there's people that I've gotten out of the strength conditioning into the business side, you know, Aaron Osmus, great example, when, uh, when I was at Hammer helping Aaron build uh, uh, the, the new facility at USC, okay? One thing that, that on all my trips out there I always talked about, because he always asked me, man, you're always on the road. You're traveling all the time. I said, no, nah. I said, it's, but it's not like that. I'm, out, I'm on the road two, maybe two and a half days a week. But when I'm home, you know what's number one? My kids, my family, okay? I cook my kids breakfast. I put them on the bus. I'm there when they get off the bus. How many strength coaches can say that? How many coaches can say that, okay? Yeah, I might travel two and a half days a week and be gone, but they don't know any better. They know dad does that. That's what I do for a living, okay? But I can tell you that, that when Aaron got fired at SC and was well, had been home for a couple months on that contract, he called me and his exact words were, Rich, I've been cooking breakfast for my sons. How do I keep doing that? That was his touch of reality, okay? <clears throat> Heather Mason, another one. You know, I, I, I spent, gosh, I, I tell you, Heather, I gotta give her credit because I spent probably two hours and close to three hours on the phone with her, okay, one night. And we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know, and, and when you talk about a brand, you talk about a touch of professionalism, the next day, uh, uh, arrived at my doorstep this massive fruit bouquet, okay, from from Edible Arrangements, all right, with a card in there. Thank you very much for taking that time, okay, and 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 that's something that's always hit me because you gotta you gotta pay homage, you gotta pay back, okay, whenever you can, and uh, uh, to to be able to help people like that. Lawn Records, another one, you know, Lawn, uh, when when uh, when I was a hammer and he he uh, he called me and and. He was already taking the job at, at, at Illinois, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, his wife wanted to stay in, in, in 
Philadelphia. What are you going to do? You just left one job. Now you got to you got to do something. You know, he made that transition into the business world, and and it's thriving, thriving like crazy, and doing a great job. You know, it uh, it's not for everybody, okay, but you got to keep your doors open. You know, you got to keep your doors open to be able to reach out and, and, and try to see what you want to do professionally. Well, I think the biggest thing to take away from that would be the simple fact that you are your brand and you don't know where this road is going to take you 20 years from now. You don't. You know, and, uh, and that can take you in, in a number of directions and things that we don't even think about, like tactical strength conditioning and things yep. like that that are popping up now. Would have never thought about it 20 years ago. There's more opportunities you know, today no than there was and when I started. I can tell you that. But it's also more competitive. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's also more competitive, and so you are your brand. And if you're if you're not good, you're going to get exposed quickly. And uh, it's a young man or young woman's game, you know. But just like a business, just like a business has to evolve to stay at the top of their game, you have to stay at you know you have to evolve to stay at the top of yours. That may be creating positions like John Denman. That might be yeah. that might be transitioning into a business or whatever it may be. But the biggest takeaway that I took from what you just said was. Simply, if you don't have it, it, just coaching by itself, is it going to lend itself well to a transition to business or a transition to administration or a, business, a transition to something that we're not thinking of? If you don't develop skills outside of counting to ten every yep. single day, you know. And so um, we talk about that as a staff all the time, but also, and we talk about it on the podcast a lot of times. But it's an important part of this. And just like, you know, the coming of conversations and Rich can attest, we, we talk all the time. Oh, yeah. On, you know, I mean, family is the number one team. You know, family is the number one team. And, uh, and finding a way to make sure that's, that's the deal. But as strength coaches, we have to do a better job. And as a profession, we have to do a better job of finding ways to stay in the profession. You know, because when those, when those times of adversity hit, that's when it's like, oh no, let me go start a gym. Oh, by the way, I don't have a, any kind of accounting background. I don't have any kind of managerial background. And I don't have any, you know, this, that, or the other customer service background. And you fail. Yeah. You know, and strength coaches don't do very well at failing. Not very well at all. So it's important. I want to I want to transition a little bit into you know some facilities. I mean, the other part of that I took out of your story, your journey is the fact that we talk about this a lot and our staff's going and visiting some uh, programs in the next couple of weeks, but site visits are huge. And walking into facilities, you learn so much in 10 minutes, you know, um, you know that you'll ever learn in, the, in a book, in a magazine, yeah. or whatever. You know, what by putting facilities together, you know, and, and you know, here I was, South Florida, we're in a 2,000 square foot weight room with holes in the wall, and all of a sudden I get to build a 12,000 square foot and then, and then I go to Tennessee, and I'm, you know, and I'm in a 13,000 square foot weight room, and we build a 23,000 square foot weight room. Yeah. I never had experience with that, you know. And most strength coaches, when they get that opportunity, have you know. What are some of the most common mistakes that a strength coach makes when they give them this opportunity to design their their dream weight room? You know, I I don't know if uh, I don't know if I'd call all of them necessarily mistakes as they are things that they learn from after the fact, okay? It's always number, number one is they don't put storage in the room. They don't, they don't think about storage, okay? That's, that's number one. I can't tell you how many rooms I've walked into. I, I, I had a, uh, a room that I actually got to draw and watch come to fruition was the uh, San Francisco 49ers room, okay? Uh, and, um, Mark Uyama called me and he's like, hey, I think we're going to be able to do this and, and what do you think? Can you, can you work me out? Might have made him a couple mock-ups, put some drawings together and stuff and, and for the most part, they took that drawing basically and they built that room, okay? Well, one of the things that, that I even looked at from, from my learning standpoint on that was I go in, uh, it was probably six months later, right? Well, after all the equipment went in, flooring and everything else went in, now it's moving. It's, it's a working organism, okay? It's growing every day. People are in it up. Excuse me, you got things happening. You got all these things going on. Well, I looked over in the corner. All the accessories are just standing there. You got stuff in milk crates. You got stuff in plastic bins. How many rooms do you walk into? And, and, and heck, 
half the schools should be sponsored by Rubbermaid, okay? Or, or all the milk crates that everything comes in, that's what all the accessories are sitting in. So one of the things that, that uh, um, I noticed and, and, and really started taking a lot of notice of is, is that fact, nobody does anything on the storage side. So you, you, they go through this process of development that they, they forget. That's like an afterthought, right? So that's something I would tell people right away. Um, the next thing is, is that I would say, you don't have a, let me see a piece of paper here. Um, I don't have a blank. You don't have a blank one? All right, pretend like this is, this is a, a, a blank square, all right? I would ask you is, what is the most expensive thing in your room, okay? So if this is a blank square right here, What's the most expensive thing in a room? Flooring. Flooring? flooring as well. What's the most expensive thing in a room? Your racks. Racks. I always get racks, cardio. Not many people say flooring, so I have an appreciation for what you're saying. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. The most expensive thing in your room is a square foot of space. Yep. Okay? So you, you got to look at it like that. you got to say to yourself, all right, if I've got one square foot of space amortized over time, that's the most expensive thing in that facility, all right? You can't waste it, all right? You gotta look at the corners of the rooms. You gotta look at how the room's laid out. You gotta look at the flow. You gotta take advantage of columns, all right? Take advantage of columns and have stuff custom built to wrap around a column in order to take advantage of storage, okay? You gotta really look at your room and say to yourself, what are the nooks and crannies I can hide stuff in order to keep stuff out of my main area, in order to be more dynamic in the room. You know, two major things have happened over the last 10 years, okay? In rooms, with training. Space has replaced equipment. Think about that. Space has replaced equipment. When you walk into rooms now, you don't see the lines of benches, okay? You don't see lines of, uh, it used to be you saw a line of a bench, line of incline, line of military. But what's happened? We got more functional with racks and we took away all this and created more space, all right? Now, you don't see lines of machines. What happened? We take them out, now you see open space, okay? Everybody wants more open space. And in that open space, it's either rubber or where it's turf, okay? And in most cases, when people don't have access to an indoor facility right next to them, or they don't have access to an outdoor area of turf, they'll put turf in their room. One of the biggest thing, complaints I get after the fact is, man, I should have made that area bigger, okay? I, I, they use the turf area so much in a room. That's one of the biggest things I see. The other side is that's, that's, that's changed is, is training that has moved outdoors, okay? So you're doing a lot more stuff outside with outside implements or even you go to UCLA and Mike Lynn has half racks lined up outside literally and they're lifting outside. You know, so you got a lot of different things that have happened. Moving training outdoors and you got this open space concepts now in rooms, all right? The other thing that goes along with that is we've pretty much nullified taking platforms out, all right? Platforms are disappearing from, from the earth, all right? Unless they are uh, uh, Olympic purist, all right, or just flat out like the wood look, platforms are, 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 are a thing of the past because now everybody's doing inlays, okay? And even, even myself, when, I, when I'm selling a room or talking to a, a coach about the design of a room, I tell them all the time, I'm like, well, why do you even want the platform, okay? To, to ask them and get them to thinking. And they're like, well, you know, I, I, I like the wood. Well, why do you like the wood, all right? Most people will say, well, I like I like the I like the wood because I like the give in the wood. I like the, I like the wood when it when I'm the feel of it. And I said, all right. Well, when you go to an inlay, you have no give because you have three quarters of an inch to an inch on top of concrete. Okay, so you're basically in a solid state. It's not flexing. All right, there's no subfloor to it. So so it, it's it's educating on that side and getting people to understand. Okay, when you, if you want a rubber inlay, all right, do you even need the look of a platform. You could just do a logo. Or reality side of it is, you could do nothing, okay? That was one of the big things when when, uh, uh, when John Deppman was doing Wisconsin. His room was on ellipse, okay? And, and we were putting platforms in, in the drawing. Well, the problem is, was getting everything to, to, to mess you up, all right? Well, the only thing you can go by is a drawing, okay? So, so he's like, man, he goes, yeah, but it looks off. 
well, John, I can't get it perfectly because you're on this ellipse. We're going to we're gonna have to shear them up once we get in there. And I said to him one day, I said, you know, I said, you ought to just not even put platforms in. And the concept hadn't even, he, he was like, what? And I, I, I got to have platforms. I said, why? I said, the reality side of it is when you take, when somebody receives the bar out of the rack, it's a step, step, settle, go. Okay? They're not walking around with the bar. They're not moving around your room with a seven-foot bar. They're staying in that one space. So the concept of a platform technically is a parking spot. So what do you need to have right there? All right. So that's, that's one thing that I've, I've seen drastic changes on. Okay. I've seen that really, really go through and, and, and massively see change. The other thing that's really in the last three to four years, the amount of, uh, you know, when I was with, uh, uh, you know, Hammer Strength, I had, I had two engineers that we were in a big meeting like this, we're sitting talking, and I realized they had never been actually into facilities. Okay. And I told them, I said, guys, I said, I want you to fly into Boston. I'm going to take you on a trip. And, and in three days, we hit 24 facilities going from Boston to Philly, okay? And I mean, it was balls to the wall, going, 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 right? But the one thing on day two, I asked them, I said, what, what have you noticed? And they said, we're blown away at the amount of things people are using a rack for, okay? So, so what's happened is you got companies you know, like Hammer, Powerless, Sornex, and everybody else that, that is really, uh, uh, dove into the accessory side of the business, okay? And, and creating so many accessories that you can stay in that one station and you can live, you can do your entire thing, okay? And there's not a thing you can't do workout-wise that you can't have happen right there. So you're not moving around the room, okay? And it's kind of funny because uh, um, uh, I was at the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates, Brandon over there said, he goes, they, they, they had looked at their training program and said, all right, how can we reduce the amount of time we're moving in the room and get more quality workout? And he told me that they had reduced the amount of movement by eight and a half hours a year. Okay? So eight and a half hours a year of movement they had taken away just because of the way they designed their weight room. Okay? So, so he looked at it as more time on task and more development. So, so when, you, when you hear things like that and you think of the design aspect of a room, you know, the other thing is, is that, uh, um, you know, I think that people, when, when, when they're designing their program, I think people tend to look forward and say to themselves, well, if I'm not here, what's the next coach going to do? Okay? You know, and, and my thought process is on this. I wouldn't worry about the next coach because you got to worry about keeping your job and doing what you're doing in that room where you're at at that moment. Okay, let the next coach worry about what you're doing. You know, and I think that's one thing where where people tend to want to want to want to develop. And I and I, I get trying to take care of people. I understand that part of it, but at the same time, do what's right for your program. Okay, when you're designing that room, you know, uh, um, one of the uh, um, one of the other things that. Uh, uh, when it comes to, you know, I get all kinds of questions. Well, how many racks do I need? How many of this? You know, you, you got you to gotta look at your program from a holistic standpoint. You got to look at your program from a flow standpoint. And you got to say to yourself, if I add that extra rack, how, how much more efficient can we be as a team? Okay, how, much, how quicker can we get them in and out? How much more work can we do? You know, uh, um, I don't think, I think some people, you know, uh, um, some people buy into a lot of the a lot of gimmicky stuff, okay, and that's fine. You know, do you, do you need all the gimmicky stuff in the beginning? I don't I don't, I don't think so. You know, I, I do know that uh, uh, in the past people used to laugh at technology, okay, in a weight room. They used to say there was a lot of people back in the day that would say uh, uh, technology doesn't have a place in the weight room, okay. Today, technology's got a place in the weight room. And, and it's and it's forming how we're training. You look at uh, you look at what the Eagles are doing and, and a whole uh, uh, mantra of what, what's going on there. And and, and, it, and it is. It, I see it across the board. I see it affecting people. I see people. You know the monitors people are putting in or, or how they're doing tendos or how they're doing. Everything is leaning towards a more technically 
functional room, okay, from a technology aspect, all right? And, and I think that's something that everybody's got to keep in mind as they're, as they're continuing to develop rooms. You know, uh, um, but I, I think that the other, the other side is, is that uh, uh, you don't need big offices, okay? You don't. How long, how long are you in there, you know? I think group meeting rooms, I think every, every, every facility needs a conference room. I do. I think every, every facility needs the ability to sit around a table and, and communicate in some way or form besides email. Okay, I think that's one of the biggest things. Uh, and, um, I think that uh, uh, when, I, when I look at some places, and I'll tell you this is going to sound crazy, I've seen facilities forget to put water fountains in a, in a, in a weight room. Okay, you know what? Electrical outlets. And yeah, electrical and outlets, cable. When you're, especially when you're building a new room. When you're building a new room, that's the cheapest time. You know what? Put an outlet wherever you want. Put them up high, put them low, put electrical everywhere. Put that. it, it, That's the cheapest point right there to do it. And, and, and sometimes people forget about that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, um, I think that uh, um, really breaking your program down and really looking at focusing on the flow is going to help you design that room. You know, I, uh, I was very lucky that when, when, when I was at Boise State, uh, uh, we had four platforms when I got there, okay? And uh, um, kind of funny story, but I went to Home Depot and, 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 and got Home Depot to give us wood. And in return, we did a couple powerlifting meets in our parking lot. I remember Joe back then was like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I said, we're gonna do this. So I built 18 platforms myself and, and, and 32 plyo boxes, okay, out of all this wood. Painted them, logoed them, everything. But we didn't have a budget, so we had to create. And and that's the thing that where you know uh, uh, I think some people we some people lose that creativity sometimes and realize that you know we can we can we can do things. You can figure out how to make it. You can figure out how to go get it if you don't have it. You know. And then I went from there to uh, uh, to doing two rooms in Atlanta as a coach, but one was Westminster Schools, and it was six thousand square feet. I spent about four hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment. Okay, uh, and this was in 2001, all right? I was a strength coach only, I didn't teach classes, and I had a full-time assistant, okay? And, and that was during a time where it was unheard of, okay? I had, I remember that NSCA, we brought 50, it was roughly 50 coaches through that room. York Barbell brought them in to see that room, okay? And we toured people through and they were blown away. They're standing there looking at this room going, 18 racks, nine platforms, you got all the machines, you got cardio, you got this dumbbell area. But I wrote a couple articles for Strength and Health magazine. One was designing the premier high school weight room and the other one was the management of a premier high school weight room. And I'll tell you that, that you know, the thought process that, that I put into that room was because of all the facilities I'd been in, okay? And, and, and I go back and I always look at that room and I say to myself, what would I do different today? Okay, and, and the biggest thing that I would do different today is I would have had this whole center of the room would have been turf. Okay, we had carpet back then because nobody thought about putting turf in rooms like that. You know, but, uh, uh, but that room was extremely functional to that school and to the program. And, and very proud to say Eric Lucas is the head strength coach there now and has been for, for I think almost 10 years now. It's set up the exact same way today as what it was then. Okay, and I take a lot of pride in that because the, the, the structure of everything that we did back then was right. Okay, and it's been through three head coaches. And, and, and when you can do that and know that somebody can walk in and, and consistently run a program that's, that's based on that school's needs, that's what you gotta do for your school. Yeah, I think two things you, you said in there that really stood out were, one, I think you gotta, you gotta think outside the box. You know, um, you know, and so innovation happens, you know, every day, you know, and so taking a risk and, and, and thinking outside the box and you know, what about inlay platforms or what about turf in the weight room or what about, you know, all these things, they all, they all stem from an idea from somebody, you know, and, and so. Well, look at some of these rooms now, right? When you, when you, they're putting turf heels, you know, they're putting hills in. Yeah. You know, when, when yeah. you were in Tennessee, yeah. we talked yeah. about that stairway, yeah. how you exactly were going right. to do hills. Yeah. You know, they're doing sand pits in the rooms. You know, they're doing turf hills. They're bringing, they're bringing outside elements into the room, okay, where they can't have them outside, but they're going to bring them inside from a training purpose. Yeah, no question. And I think the other thing is, is that 
Uh, you don't know it all. You're not, you're not an expert, especially if you've never done it before. And even if you've done it before, you know how much you messed up the first time. So, you know, you should lean on the people that, um, that have walked the path that you're walking. You know, and so reach out to coaches that have done it, and especially the vendors. You know, they're the yeah. ones that are going in and seeing the, the latest and the greatest and they're seeing what people did well and what they didn't do well. You know, and, and uh, sometimes it's an adversarial type of relationship where it's like, oh, man, I, I got to, you know, Somebody's coming in. It seems like every every day somebody new is coming in, and they get and and, and, and it's challenging when you're, you've got a busy day. But the reality is, is that you know people that, that work for these companies, are, a are typically great people. B have usually been in the strength field in some sort of fashion, and C are a huge resource. You know, and uh, it's and it's such a, a you know it's an approach that I've taken that's really benefited me in more ways than one. You know, a couple uh, last questions here. One is. You know, specifically flooring and, and play by far best flooring, and, and it's not even a question of where you should go. But when you're when you're sitting there with the AD in the office, you know, AD, the president, the you know, development office, and all these people are like, okay, well, what's this three quarter? Why is this three quarter inch rubber flooring so much different than this three quarter inch rubber flooring? What should you specifically look for in a floor, and what are the arguments to say, you know, what why it's why is the premium the premium, and why is this not? Well, that's a loaded question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. What do you look for? And then well, there's only one company that doesn't. Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, I, I used to have a saying, I still have the saying, when, when, and I learned this a long, long time ago. And this comes back to that statement I said about integrity. You know, one thing you can't do in this industry is you can't bad sell another company. You can't. You can't bad sell somebody. As soon as you start bad selling, everything goes south for you. Okay, and and what, how I answer a lot of those questions is, is this: you have you have this is this is the the base cost of a floor, and then you have base cost of the floor up there at that ceiling. Okay, and and within that range, you have a lot of different types of surfaces. Okay, you have you have very thin stuff that's hard as concrete. To, to very shock absorption stuff that's energy return at the top. Well, the reality of that, that's a huge price point, okay? And, and I think that uh, uh, you have to, number one, know what you're gonna do with the surface that you're purchasing, okay? Hands down, all right? I'm not gonna make this commercial about play, but I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be real here. You gotta know what you're gonna do on that surface. You gotta know what kind of training you're gonna do on that surface. Okay, and 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 you got to understand and know what good floor does for you as coaches and for your athletes. Okay, you know uh, uh, a great floor for you as your, you as coaches. You don't go home with your ankles, knees, and hips hurting. Okay, you got energy return through the day. Okay, so you got a floor in there that, that, that does not feel like you're standing on concrete all day. Okay. And, and all of you know what I'm talking about. You've been there, right? You know, uh, uh, Lauren Seagrave, when we, when we redid uh, IMG Academy uh, for him, he turned around and, and, I don't know, like six months later, he calls and he says, man, he goes, I finally figured it out. I changed my shoes. I changed the way I was trained, stretched, doing everything I couldn't figure out. He goes, finally, my ankles, knees, and hips stopped hurting. And it was because I was standing on a different, your surface, a different surface compared to what I was before. You know, and uh, um, so I think you got to truly understand for your athletes. Okay, you got to know and understand. A, a some floors are are great looking floors, but they're not designed for weight rooms. And and here's the reality of it is, if you go and you look at the national or world global standards in floor for weight rooms, okay, they were written in the 70s. All right, nobody's ever updated the standards for weight rooms. All right. So, so what was written in the 70s is not what should be used today, okay? And uh, um, so when you're, when you're looking at uh, a, a surface to go in the weight room, you need to talk to companies and you need to find out and ask, what was your product specifically designed for, okay? At Play, we went and we talked to coaches, okay? And, and we talked to coaches to find out what their needs were, number one. And, and we watched, we looked at the competition, we looked at what was out there, and, uh, and we developed a surface that is, is gonna have amazing energy return, it's gonna have an amazing absorption rate, 
and it's dense. It is not soft, it's not squishy, it's a dense, extremely dense floor. We put double the rubber in it, double the urethane. And the reason for that is, is that uh, uh, some floor can be like quicksand, okay? If you're, if you're doing movements on soft floor and there's no energy return, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose power through absorption, okay? So to turn around and, and have uh, a floor that's gonna give back in return, that's what you wanna look for, all right? The other side to it is, is that uh, uh, you, want, you want to look at your, 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 your surfaces and, and in the facilities and you want to say, okay, you know, uh, uh, there, there's, there's a multitude of different regular recycled rubber products, okay, that are, are a very hard, all right? There's no energy return, there's no absorption, and, that, and that's majority, that's a commodity product. Okay, so when you're talking to your AD or you're talking to your head coaches and stuff, you know, anybody can go out there and get a floor for two dollars and something a square foot, and they can go put it in a facility. All right, is that what you want for your athletes? No. Okay, and what's happened over the last five years? Coaches are getting better educated. Okay, coaches are realizing that that flooring does matter. Okay, and in that process, they're actually in some cases, giving up equipment space in order to get a better floor. I've had four coaches that I could sit here and name that, that instead of 16 racks, went with 12 racks. The reason they did is because they wanted our floor, okay? You know, and, and that could be the case for other flooring companies too. But the reality side of it is, is that uh, uh, you want a surface that is going to perform just like you want your racks to perform, just like you want your bumpers to perform, you know, and, and, and that, that's a whole other level. You know, uh, how a bumper drops, all right? I always ask coaches, and I'm going to test you interns in here, which way do your bumpers bounce, left or right? I want you to think about that. Because consistency on platforms in most rooms, when, when a bumper hits, it either goes to the left or it goes to the right. Right? In a lot of cases, what you're going to see is you want a floor that's going to absorb the energy or it's going to come down, okay? And it's going to absorb into the floor, right? You want, you want, you know, that's one of the amazing things about our Achieve product, our 18 mil. When we're at national shows and, and you got somebody hitting a snatch or clean or a jerk and they're dropping it from overhead, and when people are walking by, you know the sound you expect to hear when you have weight dropping from that high. But the sound you hear is totally different from what you expect, so it grabs their attention, you know? And that's why we, we do a lot of lifting competitions at shows, you know, deadlift to, to cleans, whatever, and that's why we, we'll bring stones in, and we'll point drop stones on floor, okay? Because we, we want to show that floor being abused, okay, as much as possible. And, and I had a coach, I had a coach, this is pretty cool, right? I had a coach, uh, high school coach out of St. Louis, who, who came up to me this last year to show. The year before, he had seen our floor, he had seen Big D dropping the stones, point dropping stones and challenging coaches all day long. He went into the training hall, he went into the exhibit hall that night with his phone, on, with a flashlight on. And he told me, he said, I got down on the floor and I was looking, he goes, and I took pictures and I, showed, I told my AD, he goes, man, I watched him drop that stone for three days, okay? And he goes, there's not a mark on that floor. And he goes, that's why I bought your floor. Okay, and it was it was an amazing testimonial live sitting right there. And uh, um, so I so I I tell you that that, that you got to number one, know what you're going to be using the floor for. Number two, you need to understand the difference between soft, between firm, between the absorption rates and and and, and return of power. Okay, and and. The one thing that I haven't brought up that I will now is, is this. You gotta know who's gonna service you. I'm gonna tell you right now, you got to have confidence in who is going to service you, okay? And that's one thing that, that, that we take massive pride on at play. And that's one thing that I, I'll tell you, there, there's, there's a lot of companies out there at all levels, okay? That, that from catalog companies all the way up to direct sales companies that cannot service you as a staff, as a facility, or a coach. That, if, if you take anything out of this podcast and this conversation, take this, write it down, tattoo it on your arm, remember it. 
you got to have confidence in who's going to service you and who's going to take care of you. Because I can tell you this, quote me now, flooring is construction. You're going to have issues, whether it's moisture, whether it's it's a, an additive in the concrete. You know, we're, we're working with Eric Quorum down at, down at uh, uh, University of Kentucky right now. They're pouring their slab literally tomorrow. Eric called me, said, all right, we're getting ready to pour the slab. We're going to, I said, hey, I said, make sure to take note of any additives they're putting in to dry that concrete out faster, okay? Because laying floor is almost a science. It's not just about the floor, it's about the adhesive underneath also, okay? So, so and, and underneath that adhesive, I, I've learned, right, I, I, my mind in the last two years has grown because underneath that adhesive, you got concrete, right? Well, the moisture levels coming up through that concrete and or the additives that they put into that concrete in order to help dry it, well, that adhesive might, might not ad adhere because of the additives, okay? So if we know what the additives are, then we can change the adhesive, okay? It happens, all right? You're gonna have issues. You're gonna have issues of uh, 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 seam issues because you got ridges in your floor, all right? If floor prep, I'll tell you this, one of the biggest fallacies out there in everybody needs to understand is this floor prep, okay? I had, I had an installer, I was at Chelsea Piers in New York, and I'm, I'm in slacks and a shirt, and I'm standing there, just came out of Manhattan from some meetings, and uh, uh, I, we're, we're installing, he's installed some turf. He says to me, he goes, he, goes he, he knew I wasn't from the flooring industry, and this was part of the education process. And I said, uh, he goes, let me show you something, so that I'm, gonna, I'm gonna help you. We were on our hands and knees, okay? I'm down there, he gives me a razor blade, and we're scraping. And all this, this fine stuff is popping up off the floor. And it's all these layers of previous glue, it's this lacquer, it's all kinds of stuff, paint, you name it. He looks at me and he says, all that has to come up. The slab has to be clean, okay? And then, and then there's other tests. You know, uh, uh, you, take a, you take a two by four, turn it on the side, and, and, and you turn it, and you don't want less, uh, more than an eighth of an inch variance. Okay, anywhere on the floor, right? Because then you won't have the undulations. If you have ridges or undulations, you're gonna get peaking seams, okay? There's all these things that, that come into play when you're doing floor. You know, uh, um, one thing that you gotta understand too about floor is rubber's always moving, all right? You're all, it, it's, it's always moving. It's, it's contracting, it's flexing, you got things happening, you're walking on it, you got, uh, you got weights banging on it, you got all these things going. It's just like a piece of cardio that's gonna break down or a bar that's gonna break a bushing or something else that's gonna happen. You gotta service it, right? You gotta clean it, right? And that comes back to when you pick up the phone to call somebody, who's coming out to fix it, right? Who's taking care of your floor, okay? And, and so that, that's kind of the, the, the key points that I think everybody needs to pay attention to, you know, and, 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 and go, no, I couldn't agree more. And I haven't gone through that process. It is. It's, it, it's, it is. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's construction. You know, uh, two quick things, and we'll, we'll get you out of here. You know, what's, this might not be quick with you, but what's the best piece of coaching advice you've ever received? Ooh. And if you quote Joe Kidd, we're shutting off the camera. No, you know. <laughs> you. Oof. You know, uh, uh, Best piece of coaching advice. I'm gonna think about this one for a second. Um, you know, I probably have to go back to high school when when I was wrestling. Uh, uh, coach John White was my my coach in Texas, and and uh, um, the one the one thing uh, uh, I was in an influx and a road in life where. I found other things besides wrestling, okay? And, uh, um, you know, girlfriend's life, everything else at that point. I remember, I, I, I'll never forget, because that was the first time in my life I'd wanted to quit wrestling. And I was sitting in his office, and, 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 and I'll tell you, um, you know, he sat there and he, he, he talked to me, number one. He gave, gave me advice on life, he gave me advice on wrestling, and he gave me advice on family, okay? And, and I can tell you that, that what, what I, and where this is coming around to, did he give me coaching advice? No, but it was what I learned and what I remember in that office. And, and it's that 
Every one of your athletes are people. Every one of your athletes have problems. Every one of your athletes have issues of some type, okay? They're gonna try to succeed. They wanna succeed for you, okay? They, they, they wanna perform. They don't wanna come in here and fail. There's not bad kids, all right? I can tell you that, there's not bad kids. There's bad coaches, or there's coaches who don't know how to reach certain kids. And I, and I think it's important as a, as a head coach and a leader, you're not gonna reach every kid, okay? You gotta find somebody on your staff that knows how to reach the kids you can't reach. And you, and you gotta talk about that stuff. You know, I, 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 watched, a, uh, uh, I watched an athlete that was a, uh, uh, a volleyball player, phenomenal athlete. I watched her go through eating disorders. I watched her drop out of a sport. I've, uh, um, I've had, uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, I had a, a, a roommate that basically, you know, we had to talk off a ledge because the guy was about to commit suicide in the park, you know, and, 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 and so, so you're going to come across all different things. And what you're going to realize, too, is, is that the kid that walks into your room that day that might have his head hanging down or might just need that pep talk or might just need some a friend to talk to, take that moment, reach out, okay? You got, and at the same time, learn how to motivate them. Learn, learn what's going on with their family, all right? You, you, you know, when you think about it, you look at kids. I've been, I've been very fortunate as, a, as not just a strength coach, but as a wrestling coach, uh, uh, to have some, some very successful teams and take some kids pretty far. Uh, and, uh, but I can tell you that I got to know each of them, you know, and I got to know what, what, what drives them, okay? And I, and I learned very early in my career that uh, uh, you know your, your your first tendency as a, as a sport coach is man you get that horse that you want to run that you want to run with and man this is your stud and you tend to live into favoritisms you tend to kind of let things slide you know and that's when you hit that real point as a coach where you say to yourself you got to make those tough decisions okay you got to make those tough decisions on the discipline side you got to make those tough decisions on the education side but it's reach out and know your people. Okay, I, I, I firmly believe that. I could sit here and tell you advice that I've been given from, from a coaching aspect, or you know, I could tell you that, 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 that I had, you know, Mike, I was very fortunate to have Mike Bergner do my USAW class back in 1995, and, and I could tell you that, that uh, uh, half his cues, him and Mike Conroy, what they, what they went through, and I could go through stuff like that, or I could, I could sit here and tell you that, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, when Dr. Fleck came in into to the room every day and would, would you know, you're in there training at the Limit Training Center, you're doing things, and here's a guy who's written every other book in the world, you know, and, and done everything you're learning and studying, and, and now you're underneath this microscope worried, what's he doing, how's he looking at me? You know, you, you can go through all that stuff, but the reality of it is, is that it comes back to you, your brand, your personality, and it's how you treat people biggest piece of advice I can give you. Oh, fantastic, man. Well, you know, this is such a relationship business. You guys can, it's easy to see why I think so highly of Rich, isn't it? You know, sure. and, uh, you know, you get, you know, when, when, when given an opportunity to buy flooring, equipment, or whatever, you buy from who you know, like, and trust. I've known Rich, how many years now? Probably 12? About 12, About 12 something yeah. Like that. yeah. Um, he's, you know, a phone call away at any moment. I like him. Guys, like you said, he's got a giving heart. Um, you can see that in him each and every day, no question. And I trust him. And you develop trust um, when you have mutual friends. Joe Kidd, mutual friend, and freaking, you know, uh, a guy that's, that's uh, impacted so so much in so many yeah. ways. And, and uh, you trust him, though, based off of when you go through all kinds of different periods in your life, who's there in each and every one of those scenes steps along the way, good and bad. And he's a guy that's been there that way. So, man, appreciate you coming on the show. Appreciate all you guys doing it. Play, awesome company. If you're in the market, check them out. And uh, just a really great, insightful episode. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Shock Talk.